Hey, Magnus. Hey, Michael. Hey. Yeah, so we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about today is um, a little bit more on the, the tax side. So it's like, uh, do you, so the topic is going to be, do you need to, uh, do we need to pay tax on NFTs and also NFT tax complications as well? Uh, we've seen a lot of artists are now getting into the space, a lot of producers, and people are just wondering, it's like, oh, do I actually have to pay tax on this? And how do I do it uh, in the legal way? But before we dive into it, can you give us a little bit of like uh, what you do and uh, what you do in the space? Sure. Um, I am the Nordic Blockchain and Innovation Lead at EY, Ernst Young. I'm based in Oslo in Norway, but we work with clients all over the world. So everything from US to Asia to, to all parts of, of the world. So I started within the space in late 2015 when I established the Norwegian Blockchain Department of EY. And we've grown that now to we are close to 30 people who works on this on a daily basis. So it's A to Z within this landscape, everything from tax legal advice to we have a fraud forensic team. We have uh, sustainability teams. We have audit accounting, bookkeeping, and also working close together with our global development team where we have more than 300 core blockchain developers and also 14 core blockchain hubs. So we assist everything from small startups to public listed entities and also aim to stay ahead of the curve, so sort of saying, been having a DeFi group in place for more than four years now. We have also had an NFT uh, group in place, also working close together with governments, of course, relevant stakeholders there. So I'm also an advisor, for example, to the United Nations crypto group on counterterrorism, etc. So, so we always aim to sort of stay a bit ahead and all, or, and and create rather and and shape the landscape from from that part. So it's it's everything I would say within this sphere. Yeah, and kind of like uh, like what have you seen recently that you know a lot of uh, have you seen more of like businesses come into play or is it more of like uh, just regular individuals? No, it's it's definitely a combination of of it all. Uh, we see, of course, more and more people who is creating everything from NFT platforms to NFT artists, uh, either on sort of the 1.0 version or 0 0.1, all depending on where you believe sort of the, the NFTs are right now. But also people who is moving in further in the metaverse mindset and thinking about sort of the tokenomics parts of this one as well. So I would say it's a good spread of everything to one, two, three man, woman companies uh, or projects, i.e. we also assist DAOs, for example, uh, to, to, towards more, uh, yeah, well-known companies such as Adidas, uh, Louis Vuitton, et cetera, who is also, of course, looking into this one. So it's a good spread, I would say. It's kind of like the, the whole industry is kind of like, it's a little bit of a mixture of everything. Um, I, I like that you mentioned DAOs. Now, uh, what was it? A16Z released out like kind of like a framework of like what DAOs are going to be. There, there's some that are considered nonprofit, some that are considered, you know, for profit. Now, how do you see DAOs coming into play in terms of like taxation? That's a very good and relevant question. And I would say that I think where we are right now, there's no government who has an overview of this one at all. I've been traveling all over the world uh, for many years, uh, assisting governments, and I have not met any government in any jurisdiction that have more than a handful of people that has knowledge about crypto in general, then I mean buy, hold, sell mechanisms of crypto. So if you ask about DeFi or the NFT landscape, and, and different uh, token standards, et cetera, they're totally lost. And you can't blame them because it's it's even for you and me, it's hard to follow everything that moves around there. So, so I would say what I clearly see and also partially fear is that we have guidance from FATF, the Financial Action Task Force out there who came just before, before Christmas on some guidance. And we have already seen, for example, Estonia implementing those guidance. And it means that if you are to create a decentralized protocol, you need to have a KYC on all your clients there, not only on the onboarding, but everyone who is using the platform. And as you and me know, uh, if you're looking for a current market, that could be a slightly challenge to, to make that product grow. So, so I... I I foresee that these type of guidance could call it blindly be implemented by different governments uh, because they don't have uh, an overview of this themselves. And it's rather better for them to then just trust FATF as a good old trusted friend in terms of financial advice uh, in, in general and implement it. So it's kind of ironic also towards the part that we see in Europe now 
with the MICA, the Markets and Crypto Assets proposal for mm-hmm. a regulation, where they originally had a sentence in saying that if you are to issue uh, crypto assets uh, or create them, you need to be a legal entity. They removed that one because they didn't want to interfere with one of their three pillars. One is, of course, protect all the stupid consumers uh, and, and also the professional investors, ensure financial uh, stability in the in the current markets, but also drive innovation because they clearly say, no, we, we cannot then restrict it because we want this kind of innovation in Europe. So what FATF is doing here is the clearly opposite thing and restricting innovation. You can think about it as, yeah, of course, they have good intentions, but they clearly don't understand the mechanisms of DeFi or how NFT works in this space in terms of classifications, etc. So that's where I clearly see sort of most most of these noise coming up. And also, of course, uh, in when, when talking about this one, I clearly see that from uh, the US side or from the, the largest NFT exchanges, of course, there's no logic if you think about it and to put on a government hat on your head and saying, why should ordinary crypto exchanges have an obligation to have AML and KYC measures in place while an NFT exchange shouldn't have it? So I personally foresee that that will come uh, either within 2022 or soon after uh, 20, uh, in 2023. And then I think we'll see a shift in the market that many actors within this sphere will move into more DEXs uh of of nfts while the market will grow so i think you have to take into consideration that it could be some noise for some years if you take in and say well how how large is the crypto market today 300 million plus 400 something like that uh, on a worldwide basis and a cautious prediction analysis says that within three to four years we will be a billion people so if the market is to to more than double in such a short time I think we will see a shift in the market also that maybe the traditional financial uh, investors who really want to go into this one also can move then better into our, our AML KYC based world. But but I think it's also down to how you uh, implement the KYC and AML there. And 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 that's a, that's a talk we could could spend all all day on sort of saying. But but it's definitely a relevant question. So I, I just came back from a workshop actually uh, last week together with the business entity register in Norway, where we are talking and considering whether or not Norway should do as Wyoming and make sort of possible a uh, possibility to register a DAO in Norway as a legal entity. So it's definitely on the agenda of the governments. Yeah, oh yeah, if if you're going by the Wyoming framework, like having it having it separated over because like a lot of DAOs right now and kind of like uh, I would say like newer companies and newer projects are still it's 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 a very gray zone, you know. Um so for like the the the, the average person if they're looking to kind of create a company, start a company or even just make their own artwork as NFTs, like what um what should they look at or what like I would say like what should they keep in mind um uh, whenever starting just so that they have their uh, bases covered? Yeah, well, I, I think you should take as a, as a, as an initial thought and and a first step. Always have in mind that if there's a gain, there's a tax. Sort of saying that's sort of the basic rules from governments, regardless of which jurisdiction you are in. And and I think many people forget that when you are sort of call it playing around with it, doing R and D or 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 sending tokens back and forth you may be considering a small amount, insignificant, or what it might be. And that might be correct in some way. But if you if you meet a case handler who is a bit skeptic towards crypto or directly negative, that person will say, do you have an overview of all these transactions? Have you paid a tax, reported it, etc.? So what we clearly see is that some of these persons who has been into this market since many years back, they might have many transactions and it couldn't be maybe before this year that they receive the control of their accounts. Then we need to correct all the numbers back in time. And if you are to do that voluntarily, you have to correct everything, even the smallest amount. And of course, it's hard to figure out whether or not you send something back and forth to, to the, the wallet of your co-developer or a friend or whatever and, and figure that one out. But that is what the governments require. So I would say, have in mind to keep a track of everything that you do. Uh, document everything you can, because if you receive a control of your accounts, it's no fun to 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 have people like us or someone else to to be able to then spend have to spend months on on assisting you in in terms of getting the compliance correctly. So document everything you do, and and also remember then that in most jurisdictions, 
if you go from one wallet that you control to another wallet that you don't control, i.e. also a smart contract de facto. So for example, if you are lending out your NFT to a person or you are using it as a collateral in some kind of DeFi solution, that could be, it, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it could be in most cases, governments are considering that one as a liquidation. Hence, you are supposed then to say, well, if you acquired the NFT for a hundred, you staked it or locked it up in some kind of way uh, for a thousand, then you should pay taxes on 900. Mm -hmm. So when you pay back or, or you pay back the loan and get it back, then it could have a higher value. And then you have a new input value of what is the basis of it. So that's also what what the, what many people tend to to forget there. But on the other side, uh, talking about if you are to create a project, what many tend to forget is that when you are listing something, all depending on you do it from your own site or if you're using Artbox, OpenSea, or whatnot, then you have some fees, uh, either gas fees or listing fees, uh, escrow fees, minting fees, etc. In most jurisdiction, that is also deductible. So remember to, to get that withdrawn from the sort of taxable amount as, as well. So that's some, some of the initial steps. But I would also like to add in that context, not necessarily core from the tax side, but rather from also building the infrastructure and the ecosystem here. What we clearly see that lots of people are doing errors on, that is that they claim that this project is about ABC, on their website, on their Discord, it's different interpretations because they want to satisfy the community. Then they have a Medium article that says something else, <laughs> which they have written themselves. Then you have another Medium article that says slightly something different that someone else is paid to do. And then you have the smart contract. What is actually written in the smart contract compared to what is written also in the terms and conditions, either the terms and conditions of the website, i.e. the platform that you're selling from, or from your yourself. So this is what, fun, uh, what what tax authorities will look into if they need to look into and classify what is this creature? Is it a financial instrument maybe? Or what kind of attributes is it? So I think it's very important to have a, a joint line there that you keep uh, your definitions at the same places in all of these places where you distribute your project. Because we see all absolutely all projects that come to us has different interpretations there and they don't think about it, but governments clearly think about it. And we also are very cautious about what kind of wording you use because you might use some wording where you don't have the intention to, to, to sort of mm -hmm. give the impression that this is a financial instrument, but by writing it, you are de facto listing it as a financial instrument and thereby you could be uh, be uh, liable to issue a prospectus from the financial authority and they can instantly shut down your project even though you don't have that intention. So it's it's very important to understand the impacts of it. So I would, I'm not here to sort of sell my services, I'm here to share, but, but I would say uh, uh, be, be in contact with someone who can just verify easily high level of 10 minutes easy just high level review of it that could make things much easier uh, going forward compared to just thinking that you're doing the right <laughs> thing here so there's there's lots of things as you can say here there's not one thing uh, so so it's it's not that straightforward as as many think unfortunately yeah like well, a few of my friends when their tax season was coming up and they're like they had their 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 wallet with like 20,000 transactions because like <laughs> their CPA was like Dude, what the hell? Like, can you label all these? They're like, yeah, yeah, we did. This is what I did. I loaned this. I flash loaned this. They're like, wait, what's a flash loan? So they started looking into it more, and uh, we had to kind of break it down. You know, help help him uh, break it down uh, to kind of like different transactions and everything. And especially for like NFT artists as well, or like NFT companies that are, or even individuals that are getting into the space. Uh, some of them know that, hey, look, I can go into OpenSea, but some of them might not know like that gas fee that's for just for that minting portion could be tax deductible. Um, and then also another thing is that whenever people are buying their NFTs, they have royalties that are associated with it. So sometimes they receive that royalties back to their wallet. So that's considered kind of like income because uh, yep. it's profitable from the, the secondary transactions. Now, yeah, the, the DeFi side is just another an, another beast. It's <laughs> DeFi side is a, a whole nother beast. But um, in terms of kind of like a, um, 
Oh, we actually have a question. Um, so it's like from Panatic. Um, it's like, where can you find tax applicable? Uh, find taxes applicable for our respective jurisdictions. That depends from uh, jurisdictions to jurisdiction what different governments has issued. Uh, Norwegian governments were the first one in the world to issue a guidance on how to tax DeFi protocols. We assisted them on that guidance. They last week issued the world's first guidance on how to tax your NFTs, which we also assisted on. So, so they have some, it's not an extensive guidance, but there's at least some pointers in direction towards it. But I would say the majority of governments uh, have some kind of indications toward basic cryptos, i.e., as mentioned, buy, hold, sell of some kind of Bitcoin or altcoins. Uh, but further than that, as you said, whether or not you are in a staking pool or if you're doing more creative uh, combinations of it, they have no clue. So I would recommend that I'm, I'm not sure which jurisdiction this person is in, but I would just recommend to take contact with the tax authorities. And I would then also recommend to not just call up an average case handler and say, hey, I have some cryptos and NFTs. Can you help me? And that person will say, yeah, I'm not quite sure. And you'll say, oh, they have no clue. We can just continue. I would urge and stress that you should then request to speak to someone who has competence within the tax authorities. And that might be just one, two, three persons. But if you just meet the average case handler, we see it all the time. You can't blame the case handler in the same way uh, if you're doing a derivative or a financial instrument in some kind of way in the ordinary fiat world and they call up the tax authorities, you don't get an answer towards that one. You cannot expect the tax authorities to have an overview of 18, 19,000 shit coins and, and uh, uh, even, even more different versions of different NFTs. But, but but just ask to be set in contact with someone who has knowledge about it, and then you will presume will receive the, the answers. So, and also in this landscape, don't trust sort of Google for what you find out there blindly, because it's very fast uh, changing landscape and legislation can be updated sort of saying also more or less overnight. So uh, don't don't trust all sort of some of the basic is the things you, you could do. But, but if you're looking into specific areas within the NFT, don't don't trust blindly what you see out there and have it confirmed with the uh, with authorities. We're, we're also seeing that uh, the kind of like the new standard that's coming up is ERC 1155s, where yeah. they can mint 721s and uh, NFTs and also ERC 20s. So yeah, or, or 998 or 875 when you're doing batching or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're starting to see that happen. And a lot of companies are, are kind of starting to go that route into like dynamic type of NFTs. So like, what are your thoughts on kind of like how that structure, like for them, like word of advice for them to um, whenever it's not dealing with uh, no longer um, just like one single asset. Now it's doing with a multiple as asset on a single router. Um, and also if there's a DeFi play in there, then like how, how would they kind of... <laughs> No, um, I, I think it's down to the boring thing that tax authorities almost always say in also the ordinary world sort of thing, and that's that every case needs to be handled on a separate individual matter. And so is the case for NFEs, because as you say, we have lots of different token standards also. So it's all down to what kind of attributes you put into it. So. There, there you have to look into it case by case, also depending on which jurisdiction you are in and listing this from, also depending on where you're issuing it. Because if, if you're issuing this one as a DAO structure, for example, you could end up that the governments could take into consideration that governance token holders, for example, could be uh, considered as a member of the DAO, i.e. someone who has a responsibility towards the DAO, and thereby you could be obliged and, and be liable for the tax purposes. So maybe you have people from all over the world joining the DAO. You have no clue, but you as the issuer of the project is the one that the governments will point at at this time. <laughs> uh, of course, they will jump the fence where it is the lowest. And thereby you could be obliged to report all of these persons' tax uh, forms in your jurisdiction and that's not something you would like to and, <laughs> and at least not be liable for their tax either so, so it's very important to understand there what you can do in terms of what you're actually issuing what you can write in terms of a disclaimer and and as mentioned all the parts of of what you are doing as a communication on this one so uh but but of course if you if you're looking into 
uh, several different versions. You, you you just have to need you you need to go down and and classify them. What what is it? What is the attributes? And then it's I would say it's it's fairly easy to to figure out how they they are to be taxed. But but it's down to also how the structure is because what we see is not only that we have DAOs out there, but we have also uh, DAO groups or pre-sale groups or whatever that is purchasing a NFT. Uh, on behalf of lots of other persons, either just your friends or larger com communities where you have no clue who they are. And there you, as the, to as the wallet holder, can be held responsible also. So have that in consideration that there's no fun explaining to the authorities, well, your wallet, i.e., which we have a controller <laughs> now, uh, has, uh, has been used to distribute some income to uh, 90 parties. What is this? Is mm -hmm. this some kind of washing? What is this one? <laughs> so, so that's what we clearly see from practice of assisting people who has just done this on good purpose, either acquiring it from your friend, your brother, your mom, whatsoever. But then again, it gives you lots of tax implications, which the authorities will need to look into further. So back again, document everything that you do in a Word or Excel spreadsheet or whatever, just easy small sentences, because then it's much better to provide that data to the authorities rather than having nothing. And also for your own sake, because you, you cannot remember exactly what you did two years ago or even one <laughs> years ago within this landscape if you are a bit active. Yeah. And, and also, um, so we're, we're about to hit the tail end of it. And we kind of like, I want to wrap up with one more question. Um, so if you kind of seen the the recent Board Apes and also Clonex, uh, Clonex, yeah basically airdrops to their community, you know, certain items, same for, for, um, the ape community, yeah. they airdropped, uh, the ape token. Now, yeah. what would be kind of like a, a word of advice for, for the ones that receive those, uh, those airdrops? I would say consider them at the fair value because many say, oh, I got a, a airdrop. I didn't even know it. Hence I value it at zero. But remember that you also have to pay in some jurisdictions, a wealth tax per the 31st of December. So, or in, in, in any way, you need to sort of classify them as, as what is the input value that you receive them at if you are to sell them at a later point, because you need to figure out whether it's a capital gain or a loss that should be calculated on them. So you have to take sort of the flush test in terms of if the authorities meet up and they ask you what, what price have you considered, will you flush or not? And, and that's have you, have you made it as a fair value. And, and, and then we see lots of people are rather uh, considering them as zero, but it could be difficult also because it's, it's one of a kind. What's the price? You have to sort of take an average or something or, or at least do your best to take a, a qualified sort of your own verification on it. So, but I would also like to say that, that lots of people are also playing around with NFTs. So for example, if I swap camera now, and let's see here, I get the, the ETH crown on my head, if you can see this. Nice ETH crown. It's, it's made by a company called Jevels. Um, and this is an NFT that I'm wearing on my head. And, and people are buying these stuff and just sending them to a friend or to others or whatever. And then they forget it goes from one wallet to another. And you don't register necessarily the input value when you buy this. I bought this for 0 0.2 ETH. And... You know, these are some these these are sort of the, the play around community that don't have the mindset that this is actually a taxable event that I'm having on my head, like it or not, it's an <laughs> NFT. So 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 that could also raise in value in terms of that. Yes, I bought it for 0.2 ETH, but maybe it was five of them, and now it's only two left. And and if the community grows, maybe um, that's worth four ETH, and and then that's the value you have to report it. So it's easy if you have something to compare it towards, but if not, try to do your best, find similarities as in the ordinary world, and, and then you will sort of be on sort of more the safe side compared <laughs> to where you are today. And I would also like to stress that from our experience that uh, most governments, they are positive towards it. If you talk to the core crypto task force group, they understand the complications of it. They understand it's something new and they just want you to do something here. So even you, if you have not done exactly the correct thing, at least try to do something and always make comments in your tax return as well. Because if you have made a comment, they cannot normally uh, in, in most jurisdictions go back and give you an additional find on this one. So hence, if you have not said anything, 
then they can give you 40, 50, 60 percent additional tax on it if they exec if they carry out the control. So have that in mind also that um, always report and document as much as you can within this uh, field. Well, thank you for having uh, you know for having you on today, Magnus. Thank you so much for providing the insights to the audience. You know, a few of them were like, "Holy crap! Like, I, <laughs> I need to get on this now." <laughs> and we 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 could continue for a couple of more hours. There's there's yeah. so much with within this landscape uh, that is going well in terms of VAT, in terms of sales taxes, also, uh, and uh, even PUAP tokens, the 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 proof of attendance tokens, like we at EY have. We are issuing these ones. Maybe we don't have a use case for them right now, zero value, but what if we use them as access keys within Metaverse? Uh, if we would move into Metaverse, maybe they get a value there. So, so even the things that, that appears to have zero value, you need to continuously have an overview and, and a fair value mindset towards what, what you're actually executing and having there. Thank you, Magnus. And yeah, uh, one quick last one. Where will they be able to find you if, if they want to contact you? Yeah, you, you're more than happy to reach out to me on LinkedIn, for example. Um, that's where I'm currently most most active as, as a boring old uh, corporate uh, <laughs> player sort of saying restricted a bit about where we can be. I'm also on Discord as well. So so you can reach out to me there or on Telegram or on WhatsApp. Uh, so, so I'm actually on, on all of this. But, uh, but uh, I, I do most posting on LinkedIn where actually EY allows me to do it. But, mm -hmm. but I'm also active in different uh, sort of core communities there also. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, you find all the links on, on LinkedIn. All right. All right. Thanks, Magnus. Thanks for the invite, guys, and also for a great summit. I uh, really enjoyed uh, both yesterday and also today, and, and really looking forward for tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you.